after 9-11 and was told by a member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff that the plan was, so this man had been told from on high, in other words, the Secretary of Defence's office, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, that they were going to um, target and regime change a series of countries in the next few years that followed that. And what were those names? Iraq, Libya, Syria, Iran. The story just is so blatant. And so, to achieve that, they had to find excuses for public consumption only to pick off those countries. So, of course, they went into Afghanistan, first of all, on the basis that bin Laden um, orchestrated 9-11 from some cave in Afghanistan, and so we must get rid of the Taliban, and we must invade Afghanistan. And then, of course, we had the weapons of mass destruction big lie, from Bush and Blair, to justify the invasion of Iraq. Tick, from these documents. Um, we had the extraordinary, extraordinary in the sense of it being so blatant, removal of Colonel Gaddafi in Libya, on the basis of he's killing his own people, when the people that he was in conflict with were trained, armed and funded mercenaries, most of them, um, funded, armed and trained by the West. So you create a situation where you create the problem by doing what I've just said in relation to these rebels and then you offer the solution which is removing Gaddafi because he's killing his own people when he's just fighting these Western um, trained, armed and funded rebels. And then, having ticked that off your list, Gaddafi's gone, you then um, go on to Syria. And um, Syria, uh, in terms of the, the rebels and the people that are behind all that, um, were largely um, shipped over from Libya when they'd done the job there. And so you had um, the attempt to overthrow Assad as quickly as they did Gaddafi. But Assad refuses to budge to this day. As a result of which they have to keep finding excuses to remove him and to help the rebels they control and dictate to remove him. And so there has been an effort um, to justify Western bombing of Syria. Of course, Obama and the British Prime Minister Cameron tried to do that a few years ago, and they couldn't get it um, agreed to. Certainly, um, Cameron couldn't in the Houses of Parliament. Um, and that was um, an attempt to justify the bombing of Syria on the basis that Assad had used chemical weapons against his own people. It's kind of a mirror of the technique of Gaddafi um, and, and that a whole uh, Libyan operation. But um, it was classic problem, reaction, solution or in this case, no problem, reaction, solution, because the evidence points to the fact that um, it was actually uh, members of this rebel group that actually um, used the chemical weapons. So, Assad won't go, and they couldn't justify bombing um, Syria as a result of this attempted conflict over chemical weapons. And then ISIS starts to emerge. ISIS being a, an outgrowth of the whole terrorist um, movement 
in the Middle East that uh, really got underway after 9-11, um, going before, but started to really uh, um, become more and more prominent after 9-11, with Al-Qaeda and, and all that, which um, uh, the evidence shows very clearly was a creation of the uh, Washington administrations. So, um, what do we do now? We, we need to tick off this latest country on our list, Syria, but he won't go. So we have to do something to get rid of it. And what they want to do, quite clearly, is start bombing Syria. So, after this um, latest series of uh, horrific atrocities, um, especially from a Western point of view, the killing of nearly 40 people on the beach in Tunisia. We had this announcement this week from the Defence Secretary of Britain. Consider Syria IS ISIS strikes, Defence Secretary urges MPs. The Defence Secretary has paved the way for airstrikes on Islamic State targets in Syria saying the extremists needed to be targeted at source. This Defence Secretary is a bloke called Michael Fallon. And the opposition party in Britain, um, Labour, um, has indicated it would not oppose military action in Syria as it did in 2013. That's when they tried to do the chemical weapons scam. Um, the party's acting leader, Harriet Harman, said Islamic State had to be stopped and Labour would look very seriously at any proposals brought forward by the government. She said the situation was uh, different from that in 2013 uh, when Labour voted against airstrikes in Syria because IS was a terrorist organisation while President Assad was the head of a government, albeit a terrible regime. A bit like our own then. And so... What's happened here is instead of directly bombing Syria on the basis of um, get rid of Assad because of chemical weapons, they've just changed the argument slightly to get support and justification by saying, actually, no, we don't want to bomb Assad, we, we want to bomb ISIS in Syria, right? Yeah, in Syria, in Syria, yeah. And, of course, the politicians who... Most most of them are not manipulating. Some of them are. People in the know, the people who are the designated front men and women for all this. Most of them are just clueless about the world they're actually living in and what's going on all around them. It's extraordinary how high you can go in the political pyramids and the system pyramids until you find someone that actually is in the know of exactly what's going on, or at least some of what's going on. Prime Minister David Cameron later said that ISIS propo uh, proposed an accidental threat to the West and its members in Iraq and Syria were plotting terrible attacks on British soil. And that's another aspect of this whole war on terror. And an aspect, very large aspect, of what happened in Tunisia. And that is to use these appalling attacks to justify more and more deletion of basic freedoms at home. To protect people from the terrorists. It's so simple and people in such large numbers still can't bloody see it. You create terrorist groups to do terror with this um, arm or this hand. And then through this hand, you use governments and military to respond to the terror. And in doing so, take away freedoms at home and justify wars in faraway lands. Well, of course, uh, the horrific events in Paris have dominated the last week and more. Um, from, from the perspective of, of what I do and, and my work, um, it's been incredibly encouraging 
to see how so many people, indeed so many more people, are not accepting without question the official version of these terrorist events. They are more and more um, asking questions to see if the official story adds up and stands up to scrutiny. Because if we don't do that, it means that our perceptions are being uh, manipulated and, and handed over to us on the basis of people just accepting the official version of everything. We shouldn't forget that it was the, um, the same officialdom, the same authorities in the collective sense, that told us there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq to justify that invasion when they weren't. It was the same authority that gave us the most outrageous um, fairy story in relation to the events of 9-11. And when so many lies and manipulations and fakery has been exposed in all these events before, it would be naivety in the extreme to then expect that when something comes along like Paris that the authorities are telling you the truth about it. Now, it's uh, too early to start going into uh, great detail about this happened and this is why it was and, and all, all that, but you can pick out the themes of um, events within what happened in Paris and connect it to other events that have actually been revealed with the passage of uh, hindsight, uh, time and research to have been a pack of lies. Um, I mean, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq um, is, is a classic. So it's ex extremely encouraging to see on social media and, and, and in other uh, ways, people in, in much larger numbers are saying, hold on a minute, we're not just accepting this by reflex action. Um, and, and that um, is what is necessary if we're actually going to stop being scammed by these um, terrorist events into giving more and more of our freedoms away or accepting those freedoms being taken away. Now, people um, who criticise those who question, my goodness me, has anyone got a mirror? I should have a look if that's what you're doing. Um, they might criticise the conclusions they come to, but, but asking questions, that's what we should be doing. And those that, that um, kind of um, criticise people for uh, asking questions and not accepting the official version of events, um, they, they come out with kind of all-encompassing one-liners like, oh, they say it's all a hoax. Well, some of these things are hoaxes and some of them are not. There are many different um, ways to set up something, to set up a problem, which you can then um, offer the solution to and, and change society in the way that you wouldn't have been able to without creating the problem in the first place to justify the, the change in law and, and, and um, uh, the way that society is run and controlled. So problem, reaction, solution. Uh, the technique that's also been given the, uh, the, the, the name a false flag, when you create a, a problem uh, covertly and then offer the solutions to the problems you've created. Um, th they're not all um, hoaxes. Um, there are many different ways that this scenario is played out. And to, to, to see more and more people grasping, at least to the point of, considering the concept, the possibility that those um, in the shadows are through those in the public eye creating um, problems on purpose with, the, with absolutely the goal of changing society as a result of the problem. To, 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 to grasp that and start to grasp that, another thing we need to, um, to consider and start to understand 
is the scale of absolute bloody evil that is behind all this. You know, because one of the things is that people uh, judge um, what others would do by what they would do. And so they say things like, they, they'd kill all those people on 9-11 just to change society. They'd never do that. No, you wouldn't do that. They do it all the time. And it's, it's this grasping of A, the scale of evil behind the manipulation of the direction of the world. And this concept of problem, reaction, solution, which that evil uses by doing its evil and then offering a solution to its evil, which leads to more um, evil. So seeing that more and more grasped, like I say, is, is, is really encouraging in terms of where we were um, not that long ago. And when I started out on this journey 25 years ago, where we, we basically weren't at all. But like I say, um, it's not that all these things are hoaxes. There are many different ways that they play problem, reaction, solution. But certainly there are hoaxes. And I mean complete hoaxes. I mean Sandy Hook, um, the, the, the shootings at the Sandy Hook school was absolutely a hoax. And uh, if you um, have not come across this, uh, well, just go to, go to my website and put the keyword Sandy Hook in. And you'll get the archive um, articles, um, including um, the work of a man called Wolfgang Halbig. And he um, is a, a man who's had a long career in security um, and safety, including um, a career looking after the safety and security of schools in the United States. And he started out. Um, accepting the official story when when um, it was all breaking in the news to the point where he actually donated to the fund. But being a professional, being someone who was um, well aware of how all this works and, 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 and what's credible and what's not, and what should happen in reacting to these things because it's his job, he started to realise that not only were... Um, the public being told a pack of lies about um, the shootings and killings at Sandy Hook, but actually there had been no killings. And that is, if you're hearing this for the first time, absolutely shocking. You're mad, mate. What are you talking about? They'd never do that. They did do that. Look into it. See, this is um, an area of research to understand the human situation that is ignored by almost everybody. You will see the research, I do it myself, and it needs doing, into political manipulation, financial manipulation, manipulation of wars, engineered terrorist attacks and all that. And that needs to be done. But the bottom line, surely, is to understand the very reality that we're experiencing. What we call life. What we call the world. What is it? It seems, on the face of it, to be very simple. It's a planet. It's a universe. And it's um, solid and stuff. It's all matter. But when you, um, when you go deeper into it, actually not very deep, really, to start with, None of that is true. We don't live in a solid world. Quantum physics has shown that for a long time. We live in an illusory world that appears to be physical, but isn't. And we are experiencing the vastly advanced uh, version of 
a video game, a simulation. And when you um, look at how people play video games, these virtual reality video games, I mean, what is happening? People put goggles on. They put headsets and earphones on. And they, you know, often put gloves on. And what that is doing is simply hijacking hacking into the way that we are decoding reality all the time. Because what is happening is that um, waveform information is being turned into um, electrical information by the five senses and then communicated to the brain and the brain then decodes that, in fact the whole genetic structure is involved, but the brain decodes that into the reality we think we're experiencing. This is what's happening. This simulation that I've been talking about for so long in, in the books um, is uh, like, a, like a Wi-Fi situation. Um, if you are in a place that has Wi-Fi, you can't see it, but it's in the atmosphere all around you, in the unseen. And the computer then decodes that information field into what we see on the screen. Uh, you know, you talk about the Internet, well, the, you say the Internet is graphics and pictures and moving pictures and words. Well, yes, but only on the screen. Everywhere else, it's just in the form of encoded information. And so what we're doing, through what I call the biological computer, is receiving and transmitting information, interacting with this field, what I call the cosmic internet. Think of it like a cosmic Wi-Fi field. And as we do so, we appear to be in a world, but we're actually only decoding it, just like the computer decodes information from the, the tower onto the screen in a very different form. So what video games are doing, virtual reality video games are doing, is hacking into that process. Through the gloves, they are hacking into the, um, the feeling sense, from, of course, sight and sound, they're hacking into those um, five sense decoding processes of the body. And what they're doing is feeding them other information to override what they would normally be decoding in the world that we call real, bizarrely, really. And so suddenly, People can be taken, and they're getting more and more sophisticated now, these uh, virtual reality games, into a world that is being decoded as if it's real. You'll see people reacting and stuff to, with the, with the um, headsets on to nothing more than information being fed to their senses for them to decode into a fake reality. Well, here's a question. What if that's what we were doing? decoding a fake reality which comes back to my question about is the earth flat is there an earth how would we know how does the computer know what's real on its screen how do we know we're experiencing this reality which appears to be so solid but isn't well there's a fake for a start And we decode into a sense of reality whatever's in the information field, just as the computer does. You change the information, you change what's on the screen. And so, if we live in the equivalent 
of a computer simulation, and I strongly suggest we do. And indeed, there are um, science projects, mainstream, well, open-minded, mainstream um, studies around the world now into that question. Is this a simulation? Is this like a video game? As, you know, some physicists have pointed out, the physics of our reality is the same, basically, as the physics of a computer game. And so the evidence is moving towards that all the time. So here's a question. Um, he who controls the simulation controls the information that we're decoding, controls the sense of reality of who we are, where we are, and what the heck's going on. So, um, press enter. Oh, the Earth is round, mate. Look, I mean, you see it from space. Press enter. Well, look, everyone knows the Earth's flat. Look at it, you can see it from space. It is that simple. And it's only when we get into these deep questions about reality itself and the actual world that we're living in or decoding to believe we live in. These are where the answers lie because this is where the rabbit hole eventually leads. So, these questions, these, these certainties that people have, so that when people like me come and question the certainties, oh, you're mad, everyone knows that. Well, how do you know that? Well, I told you at school, yeah, and where else? Well, to tell it in the media say so, yeah. Scientists say so, yeah. Um, ever thought that that information that you're getting from all these people was coming from the same source? Indeed, from the same hoax. People who, um, in these various professions, say this is how it is, are caught in the hoax, are caught in the fake reality like everybody else. Most of them genuinely believe what they say, because to them it's real. But when you start to look at reality in a deeper way, with an open mind, when you start to see the process of how we um, decode reality and experience reality, then these big questions start to demand answers. What is this place? Is this world that we are decoding real? Or is it click, click, enter? And if so, who is doing the click, click, enter? I mean, you know, years ago, oof, a lot of years ago now, um, in the 1950s, the London Planetarium opened and um, I was um, living in Leicester I was born in Leicester in the English Midlands and we never had any money um, we lived from week to week but one day like what my father came down on, on um, one of these uh, bank holidays down, came down the stairs and he announced that we were going to London what? This would have been about late 50s, so I'd have been six, seven. And um, so it was great. Went on a steam train, loved it. Gets to London, never been to London before. Um, and my father announces we're going to the London Planetarium. I didn't even know what it was. And my father had absolutely no interest in astronomy, never mentioned it, never talked about it, but now we're going to the London Planetarium. And where I'm going with this is this. I went in in the middle of the day, little kid, sat down, lights went off, 
And suddenly the night sky was above me, looking to me every bit like the night sky. And something struck me that day. He was a little kid. And I've always kept this in my mind ever since. Is this real or is this just a movie, basically? And, you know, talking of the night sky, um, we look and we see um, these stars and they're thousands, millions, billions of light years, all these fantastic uh, distances that they talk about away from us. And yet, they only exist in the form that we appear to see them when the brain, a few cubic centimetres of the brain, decode that information into the perceived reality. Because there is no time and there actually is no space. It's all an illusion. This is the simple, uh, the simple explanation for why what appears to be hypocrisy, and on one level it is, but what is really about taking over the world by picking off country after country. Now, they want to remove what are called secular regimes in the Middle East, where people kind of are chilled out about people's religion and the different factions of the religion. Um, and they want to um, take over those countries. And to do that, they need the support, covertly and otherwise, of countries like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, etc. And so, when um, you have a country that you wish to target, and I've talked in the books at, at great length over the years and in the video casts about this list of countries, including Iraq and um, Libya and Syria, etc., that was, was, was put together a long, long time before any of this ever came into the public arena. They have this list of countries for um, takeover and creating chaos and mayhem. And they have their mates and um, associates in the royal, fake royal dictatorships of these countries, most notably Saudi Arabia, to help them do it. So this is why... Saudi Arabia and Qatar, for instance, have been arming and funding the rebels, Western created uh, rebels, that have been um, attacking the regimes in Libya to get rid of Gaddafi and are attacking the regime in Syria to get rid of Assad. That's why um, they've been doing it, because they're on the side of it. See, once you, st you fall for this idea that Arab countries must support Arab countries, surely they must support Arab countries uh, against the West, then, then you've lost the plot. Because the, 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 the cement, the, the thing that holds this together, the point of allegiance, is not whether you're Arab or not, whether you're Muslim or not, in terms of these regimes I'm talking about. It's whether you are in support of this global agenda or not. And therefore, um, you will, if you're in support of it, um, um, arm, fund um, and uh, support in many other ways those forces that are taking over these countries to advance this agenda. So in that sense, the West, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Qatar, they're all on the same side against other countries and other parts of the Islamic world. 
And so you have your uh, answer very clearly uh, for why the West will condemn those countries and justify invasion and bombing and stay absolutely silent about Saudi Arabia. And there's another reason why Saudi Arabia is so important to this agenda. And that is the plan which I have laid out in my books long, long ago that was coming. And that was the plan to create a civil war, if you like, between the Sunni Muslims and the Shia Muslims to tear us under the Middle East. And of course, um, people will get so focused on I'm a Shia or I'm a Sunni, not everybody will, but significant numbers, that they won't stop, take a deep breath and see the strings attached to them, the Sunnis, and the strings attached to them, the Shia, are actually held by the same hands, which are playing one off against the other to divide and rule. Divide and rule is um, one of the most potent weapons of human control and directing uh, people in the direction that this hidden hand wants to go. And, you know, in the end, it's down to individuals because um, to think that all these centuries later there is still a division between Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims over the rightful line of succession from Mohammed. The thought that that is happening in now 2016 is staggering to me. It is the childlike playground mentality that allows the few to control the many. And this plays out with different factions of different things all over human society. What we're seeing now is the ramping up of that plan to play the Shia off against the Sunni. And although the vast numbers of Muslims are as um, as chilled out as I am about whether someone's a Sunni or a Shia, there are significant numbers of both to play off against each other and create this Shia-Sunni conflict that's so long been in the pipeline. And so... You can look at um, events in the last week or so from that perspective very clearly. Saudi Arabia um, triggered an expansion of this conflict because Iran is the center of the Shia Muslim world and Saudi Arabia is the centre of the Sunni Muslim world, in effect. And so what did Saudi Arabia do? It executed a prominent Shia cleric. Also bombed the um, Iranian embassy in Yemen during its grotesque slaughter of uh, Shia in Yemen, ongoing. And it was all designed, because Saudi Arabia is a front for this Western cabal and the hidden hand behind it, which I include Israel in, by the way, when I talk about a Western cabal. It systematically has ramped up this conflict by executing this Shia cleric. And of course, what happened, because all, this global agenda, you, you, can, you can think of it as like rows of dominoes in a room. 
And it's worked out that if you push this domino over, that domino will fall. In other words, you do A and B will uh, occur. So, of course, what happened is when they killed the Shia uh, cleric, there was a reaction in Iran, the center of the Shia Muslim world, with attacks on the Saudi embassy. This has led to the Saudi Arabians, uh, fake royals, um, ending diplomatic ties with Iran, not that there were any. And others have followed suit, the usual bloody suspects, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, or the other ones on the, on the team with the West. And now we are seeing this um, move on, this attempt to create this civil war in the Islamic world. And again, it's important that we don't fall for this, this idea of my enemy's enemy is my friend. Thus, because Saudi Arabia is so uh, grotesque and, 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 and is in league with the West, then we must say nothing about Iran. Iran has an appalling human rights record also. The, the point of um, looking at how this all unfolds is not to say good guys, bad guys. It's to explain why these events are happening. And we have a situation where the West looks on and condemns Iran and Gaddafi and Assad while not only stays silent about Saudi Arabia with its unbelievable abuse of human rights and the almost unspeakable treatment of women. I've been there. It's horrible. The way the people are crushed by a, an extreme form of Islam, which the Saudi royal fakes have actually made up and called it Islam. And the West looks on. And not only that, between 2010 and 2014, the United States sold Saudi Arabia $100 billion worth of arms, according to reports this week. And Britain, moral Britain, the mother of parliaments, has sold billions and billions of pounds worth of arms to Saudi Arabia to use against whoever it chooses to use them against. In current times, Yemen and attacks on the Shia community in Yemen that have caused vast numbers of deaths and injuries and have created mayhem and hunger in that society. Where is the West in all this? Cheering them on. And when you think in this inverted world, but it, it's inverted, but when you realize it's what team are you on dictates how we respond to you, um, it makes simple sense of what appears to be a complex situation, but isn't. When you think that the moral United States, Britain as well, um, to, a, to a lesser extent in terms of um, volume of money, but when you um, think that the United States claims to be this force of moral good, the Dodi wants peace and what's good for the world. And yet it sells more than half of the weapons its armament companies produce to other countries, many of them with grotesque human rights records. And that's absolutely the case as well with Britain. 
You know, when you look around and you see what is happening in Libya after the Cameron Obama uh, supported, NATO supported bombing, when you think that this ISIS group, which is, by the way, Sunni attacking Shia, all part of the same story, you think this ISIS group is taking over um, parts of Libya as a result of the bombing. That is planned. When you see that children in a once thriving Syria are now starving in besieged towns because of a war begun by these same moralistic uh, psychopaths then um, you can see that the world that we are presented with by the mainstream media bad regime support the bombing is a grotesque farce of what's really going on and um, the farce reached new levels this week with the response of um, Obama and the presidential candidates including Trump to this un 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 emerging um, unfolding conflict between Shia Iran and Sunni Saudi Arabia in that to quote Trump for instance quote one to quote more when asked what he would do in the face of this conflict he said we must protect Saudi Arabia we must protect one of the most evil grotesque regimes on planet earth sums it up politicians are going to change the world they created the bloody world we have to change it and you know the more I have looked at academia the more I've looked at how it works how it is itself programmed and what it says and what it does the more confirmation there is for me that the world is an inversion because these people that are held up with such esteem as the fountains of knowledge are with honourable exceptions overwhelmingly clueless about the world that they pontificate about I'm watching at the moment um, two entire series uh, of um, DVDs from the Discovery Channel called Through the Wormhole fascinating it's all about apparently leading scientists all over the world talking about their research on the nature of reality and it is extraordinary to watch symbolically it's like this first of all whenever they you know not every time but so many times when they cut to a new scientist there he or she is right in equations on a blackboard um, and that's kind of the level they're working at and symbolically it's like this they're standing next to this this animal and it's got a head it's got a big long body it's got a tail it's got four legs it's got an udder and it goes moo and they're looking at it doing a few equations while they're doing it and they're saying well scientific opinion the scientific consensus is that uh, this is a uh, elephant and uh, the equations seem to match that it's an elephant and 
where we have nothing to support it, we kind of keep saying it and it becomes a accepted fact when it's nothing more than a ludicrous assumption that this is an elephant. And then they'll say, and uh, there are one or two um, sort of radical scientists. And they'll cut to the radical scientists. Don't give him much, but they give him a bit of a say. And, and he says, or she says, um, well, looking at it, you know, and, and, and most of these radical scientists, they use the word consciousness, which the rest of them don't. Looking at it, it would appear to be a cow. Oh, radical scientist on the the fringes. No, mainstream opinion. It's an elephant. And so the fact that the cow is an elephant, he gets into the uh, the textbooks and the school curriculum and all that stuff. And I've seen this over and over and over again. And the one certainty of academic, uh, academic, academic, certainty is that at some point they're going to be proved not just wrong but often massively massively wrong do you know until the 1920s they thought there was one galaxy now they're accepted to be billions of them so I was not surprised to read this week that an academic has used mathematics, I kid you not, to discredit conspiracy theories. This is the definition in the dictionary of a conspiracy theory. Or a conspiracy, never mind the theory. A secret plan made by two or more people to do something that is harmful or illegal. The act of secretly planning to do something that is harmful or illegal. Now, you go by those simple definitions of a conspiracy and every government in the world... Um, multinational corporations, banks, the media, all these institutions of um, state and official reality, the ones that dictate how we should see the world, every kind of one of them, as at some point in terms of governments and banks all the freaking time, has been involved in a plan made by two or more people to do something that is harmful or illegal. On these definitions, the world is drowning in conspiracies. And I love the coincidence theorists. They're, they're hilarious that all these things that happen in the world and all the connections between them, which a modicum of research can start to uncover, that it's all just a coincidence and it's not being brought about by deceit and planning. <sighs> now, where did conspiracy theory come from? This immediate response by the media, academia, um, all of these are establishment functionaries in their various ways that wheel out conspiracy theorists when anyone um, tries to put a different angle and background to what's happening in the world. Oh, he's a conspiracy theorist. Okay, finish. Forget it. Okay. And yet, the term they are using uh, came from the CIA in 1967. They coined the phrase conspiracy theorists to attack anyone who was challenging the official narrative of the 
Kennedy assassination. And also, of course, the Malcolm X assassination, which was followed uh, by the assassination of Martin Luther King and the assassination of Kennedy's brother, Bobby Kennedy, when he was running for the presidency. All a coincidence, just random events, no connection, no common theme, no common cause. That's what the key um, coincidence theorists would say. This document in 1967, which coined the phrase conspiracy theorists, for no other reason than to discredit those challenging the official story, which was total nonsense, as we can see with, a, again, a modicum of research into the Kennedy assassination. Uh, April 1967, it was, the CIA wrote a dispatch which coined the term conspiracy theories and recommended methods of discrediting such theories. The dispatch was marked psych short for psychological operations or disinformation and uh, or CS for short and um, for the CIA's uh, clandestine services unit. The dispatch was produced in response to a Freedom of Information Act request by the New York Times in 1976. Um, this is what the dispatch says among other things. This trend of opinion is a matter of concern to the US government, including our organization, the CIA. In other words, someone's trying to tell the truth here. Big problem. The aim of this dispatch is to provide material countering and discrediting the uh, claims of the conspiracy theorists so as to inhibit the circulation of such claims in other countries. Background information is supplied in a classified section and in a number of unclassified attachments. Action. We do not recommend that discussion of the conspiracy question be initiated where it's not already taking place. In other words, if you're not talking about it, don't remind them that it's, it's happening, but it's there. Where discussion is active, the following addresses are requested. A. To discuss the publicity problem with and uh, friendly contacts, especially um, politicians and editors, pointing out that the official investigation of the relevant event made as thorough an investigation as humanly possible and that the charges of the critics are without serious foundation and that further speculative discussion only plays into the hands of the opposition. How many times have we heard of that about questioning who's really behind ISIS? Oh, no, that's just supporting the terrorists. All this stuff has been going on. The same methods all through the period since this um, came out. Um, point out also that parts of the conspiracy talk appear to be deliberately generated by propagandists, people who want to know the truth, Urge them to use their influence to discourage unfounded and irresponsible speculation. Brackets. What really happened? B. To employ propaganda assets to and refute the attacks of the critics. Book reviews and feature articles are particularly appropriate uh, for this purpose. The unclassified attachments to this guidance should provide useful background material for passing to assets. So this is a summary of um, what the CIA dispatch um, wanted its assets to do to discredit what they call conspiracy theories. Um, claim that it would be impossible for so many people um, to keep quiet about such a big conspiracy. Come more to that in a second when I reach the academic have people uh, friendly to the CIA attack the claims and point back to official reports. Claim that eyewitness testimony, those who actually saw it, is unreliable. Claim that this is all old news as no significant new evidence has emerged. 
Ignore conspiracy claims unless discussion about them is already too active. You know where you're getting somewhere when you do the work that people like me do because you start to get attacked in return. That is confirmation that you're getting somewhere because um, what they'd really like to do is ignore you on the basis that the public are ignoring you. Oh, it's hot in here today. OK, where were we? Um, claim that it is irresponsible to speculate. Don't ask questions, it's irresponsible. Accuse theorists of being wedded to and infatuated with their theories. Accuse theorists of being politically motivated. Accuse theorists of having financial interests in promoting conspiracy theorists. Uh, uh, theories, rather. Um, in other words, the CIA's clandestine services unit created the arguments for attacking conspiracy theories as unreliable in the 1960s as part of its psychological warfare operations. Now, if these theories, and of course they're not all correct, um, but massively they are supported by uh, detailed evidence and facts, um, if they are such ludicrous claims, why do they go to this level to try to discredit them? If conspiracy theorists are nutters, well, what's the problem? Get on with your life, they're nutters. The fear is that the public, in ever larger numbers, as they are, will realise that they're not theories at all, but are an explanation for what's actually happening in the world and why the world is going in the direction that it is. And if there was nothing to them, why has it now come out that the intelligence services have armies of internet trolls using technology that allows them to have fake login names and, and multiple numbers of them. And uh, the technology allows them to multiply uh, post all over these sites and YouTube um, video comment uh, sections. And their job is to, using their language, um, discredit um, and divert and create uh, dissent on the comments to conspiracy-based stories, websites and videos. The reason that is happening is because they're terrified, not of conspiracy theories, but of conspiracy fact being more and more accepted by the public, which it is. Now, the academic. Here's a story from this week. People can't keep secrets. Oxford study uses maths to show most conspiracy theories are untrue. Maths. An Oxford scientist has used mathematics to make the claim that certain conspiracy theories would have been exposed by now owing simply to the number of people believing in them. Note that was one of the things that um, the CIA document was saying should be said to discredit conspiracy theories. And uh, I'm not saying the scientist is part of that and doing it on purpose, but the more you repeat something the more it becomes generally accepted as the way things are. Repetition is the greatest form of mind control and perception control. So anyway, um, this maths-based idea this fella's got has to do with the simple fact that a certain number of people can only keep a secret for a set amount of time. What, all of them? Dr. David Grimes believes his formula for figuring this out works and is basically this. A secret that would last over a century can be kept by no more than 125 people. By contrast, 
one involving 2,521 people, would hardly last longer than five years. Must get my calculator out when I'm working now. Grimes assures um, that his interest is in giving conspiracy theories um, and theorists a fighting chance against the naysayers who readily dismiss anything offered up as an alternative to the official truth. Quote, it is common to dismiss conspiracy theories and their proponents out of hand, but I wanted to take the opposite approach, really, uh, to see how these conspiracies might be possible. To do that, I looked at the vital requirement for a viable conspiracy secrecy, he says. His work begins with an equation to test the probability of a conspiracy being either deliberately uh, revealed by a whistleblower or inadvertently as the result of a mistake. The length of time a number of conspirators are entered, including various other factors, such as the conspirators being reduced in number due to things like death, uh, both accidental and intended. Cry, uh, Grimes even assured a best-case scenario for the conspirators. How nice. Uh, for his study, he took four alleged conspiracies, uh, and, and, and among them were climate change truthers, who he says uh, had to involve 405,000 people. The anti-vaccination movement, comprising some 22,000, if only the World Health Organization and the US Centers for Disease Control are counted, um, and the figure grows to 736,000 if you include Big Pharma, the pharmaceutical cartel. And finally, there are an estimated 711,000 people who believe the cure for cancer is being covered up, the article says. The results were as follows from his um, maths. Um, three years and nine months for climate change to be proven a hoax. Three years and two months to reveal the conspiracy that the US public is being duped on the benefits of vaccinations and three years and three months for the cancer cure to be revealed to the world. So the math is clear on the issue. Grimes says, not everyone who believes in a conspiracy is unreasonable or unthinking. I hope that by showing how eye-watering the unlikely some alleged conspiracies are, some people will reconsider their un-anti-science um, beliefs. And he, he wants to urge the reader to consider looking at what we are as a species more responsibly because embracing reality could be ex uh, obscured by ideologically motivated fictions, a bit like science really. To this end, we need to better understand how and why some ideas are entrenched and persistent among certain groups despite the evidence and how we might counteract this. A bit like science, really. Now, First of all, climate change has been exposed as a hoax by a long series of prominent scientists and um, experts in climate science. Thing is, because they are challenging the official version, they don't get into the public arena. Therefore, it's already been exposed as a hoax but the media won't accept that, the science of this bloke Grimes won't accept that, and therefore the official version of everything prevails, and they say um, it's a conspiracy theory and, and it would have been exposed by now when it already has. Vaccines. Vaccines um, have been exposed for what they are, destroying um, still emerging, still developing immune systems by people who are um, experts in their field. But the same story, because they're challenging the official version that vaccines are good and everyone must have them, or we must make them mandatory, they get marginalised, they get attacked, they get ridiculed, and thus um, the official narrative prevails in the minds of most people. Oh, I've got to get Johnny vaccinated. The cancer cure. Do you know, um, hundreds of billions 
of dollars worldwide, and that's probably an underestimate, have been spent on so-called cancer research. And yet, the numbers uh, suffering from cancer go on rising and rising. Anyone think that's just a little bit strange? And I quote people in my book and books, um, insiders, who talk about the fact that the cancer cure has been suppressed. And as one says, it's on file at um, Rockefeller University. And that is one reason why so many of these elite bloodlines and families live so bloody long. Another thing that this guy does not put into his maths is how these cover-ups of conspiracies operate, like compartmentalization, the need to know. If you look at a pyramid, at the top of the pyramid, you've got the capstone, symbolic of the tiny few in the shadows who know the truth about the conspiracy, whichever one it is. As you come down from that pyramid peak, you're meeting more and more and more people who know less and less and less about what they're playing a part in. They're just doing their job. They're just playing their little part, putting their little piece in a massive puzzle. They don't know the puzzle. They don't know what the puzzle is. They don't know what the picture of the puzzle is. They just know their piece in the puzzle. The only people that know how the puzzle pieces fit, i.e. they can see the conspiracy, is the few at the peak of the pyramid. And thus, the vast majority of people who are involved in making these um, conspiratorial changes and transformations in the world have not a clue what they're playing a part in. Put that in your maths, mate. Then you have the few who do know and um, they are basically in two categories. A little bit of a third, and that's those tiny, tiny few who do actually um, try to speak out. But basically, they're in two, the ones who do know are in two t categories. There are those who are scared shitless at the consequences of revealing what they know because they've seen the consequences for others. And then there's the others who a part of it. They're behind it. They're driving it. Why would they reveal it? Look at what has happened to Edward Snowden. Look at what's happened to his life. Just one guy as a result of exposing the uh, surveillance operations, illegal and colossal, of the National Security Agency in the United States, the NSA. Look at Bradley uh, Manning, Chelsea Manning now, um, a US soldier who um, leaked vast, vast numbers of documents to WikiLeaks to expose the corruption of the United States government and military. He is serving uh, 35 years in prison for doing that. So, well, no, it, the maths say it would have been revealed. God save us from academia. It's the little picture. It's what's the latest Trump tweet or someone on Facebook going, oh, I'm just going to make some hot dogs. And, and people get so pulled into the twigs, if you like, that the forest is never, not even seen, but even considered, not least by the vast overwhelming majority of the media. So why aren't we asking the big questions that will give us the big answers? Like, what is reality? What is this, this place that we wake up in 
every morning. What's it all about? Where does it come from? And when you, you delve into these questions, like I say, answers to what seem to be insolvable problems start to become clear. And mysteries, which mainstream science can't answer, uh, what people call, for instance, the paranormal, um, become not mysteries anymore. Once you go into this deeper level of questioning the nature of reality. I mean, how many people realize as they go through their lives walking and driving through this apparently solid world that the only place this world, this reality exists in the form that we are experiencing it is in our heads. All of it. So if I um, come to this question, that's kind of the title of the video cast today, uh, if a tree falls, does it make a noise? Well, the answer that seems strange, well, only if you hear it, is actually um, confirmation of what I'm saying here. Because when the tree falls, it doesn't make any noise. What happens is it creates, if you like, vibrational disturbances in the energetic field, in the air. And these disturbances are picked up by our ear, earring senses and turned into electrical signals, electrical information, which is then uh, communicated to the brain. And only in that part of the brain that specializes in decoding sound does that tree falling make a noise. And even then only within a certain frequency band. And all the senses are doing this. The five senses. They're taking... Um, electromagnetic waveform information. Uh, they're turning it into electrical signals, communicating that to the brain. And that's where the decoding goes on. That turns that information into sight, hearing, touch, smell, and so on. So we're living in a world which we think is solid, that we think is outside of us, and it's not, it's only in here. Another example. Here we have, uh, oh, don't go out on me. Uh, here we have a candle, candlelight. Okay, yeah, he's holding a candle. Well, actually, I'm only holding a candle in your head and in my head. Because what you're looking at in its prime state is an electromagnetic field pulsing at certain frequencies. It has no colour, has none of the things that you see. But my sight senses take that information, communicate it to my brain in electrical signals, and in a small part of the back of the brain, which decodes visual reality, this appears to be in my hand, when actually what I'm holding is an electromagnetic field, and what's holding it, my hand, is an electromagnetic field. <sighs> Put the electromagnetic field out. So. How strange it is, but not really if you go deep in the rabbit hole, that this is not widely talked about, widely um, debated upon, so that we actually understand the reality that we are um, 
experiencing, which would mean we would live our lives in a different way from a different understanding, and we would have the uh, the knowledge to get past what appears to be constant walls of limitation and I can't and it can't be done and it's impossible you look at those various things that we think are impossible can't be done and invariably the the reason we perceive that is because the world is solid the world is not solid what the universe is and this is all provable fact by the way is um, information Think of, of Wi-Fi. You know, in this room now, um, if I had Wi-Fi, there would be an entire uh, global um, reality called the Internet, the World Wide Web, in this space, uh, apparent space, that I'm apparently occupying. But where would it be? Where's the Wi-Fi? And if, if computers didn't exist, and you said to someone, actually, in this, in this, uh, in this room, in this wherever you are, is um, a, a vast field of information uh, which you can tap into anywhere in the world um, and, and see um, this fantastic uh, collective global reality called the Internet. If people didn't realize that um, anything about computers they would say you were mad they'd say what were you talking about I can't see it where is it don't be stupid but because we know about computers now and we know about Wi-Fi and all that stuff when you say that to people they say yeah Wi-Fi I know about that yeah well our reality is in so many ways the same it's energetic information, which um, we decode, a la the candle, etc., um, into an apparently physical reality that only exists in our head. And this is key to so much. What we are looking at with this, these waveform fields of, if you like, I call it the cosmic internet, the cosmic Wi-Fi, um, is potential possibilities and probabilities um, waiting to be manifest. And what we do is take probabilities and possibilities and decode them in the way I'm talking about into an experienced reality, which we don't think we're in control of. And what makes us pull this possibility or probability into experienced reality, or this one, or this one, is our perceptions. Everything is perception. And therefore, if, for instance, you have a, what they call a rational mind, a mind where um, it is rigid in its belief in reality, then that perception will, through this process I'm talking about, become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because you'll just keep pulling into uh, experienced reality what you believe reality is. So if you... Um, apply this to this global conspiracy for human enslavement. It is, in the name of one of my books, a perception deception. All our lives from cradle to grave, we are um, downloading from the system through education and science and um, medicine and, and all these things, media, we are downloading a, a version of reality, which I call the postage stamp consensus. And thus, because our perceptions dictate what we bring into apparently physical reality in here, 
what we bring into reality in here is in line with the postage stamp consensus, what people call normal. Um, and there's this idea, you see, that to understand reality in its deepest sense, you need a scientific mind. Ooh. No, you don't. Actually, that's the last thing you need. You don't need a 